Welcome to Radical Radio with Robbie Dawkins. Robbie is a renowned speaker and equipper in over 70 countries, as well as author of international best-selling book, Do What Jesus Did. Here's your host, Robbie Dawkins. Hey, this is Robbie Dawkins, and I want to welcome you to Radical Radio. This is a viewer-supported program, and so I want to encourage you to share this, to like it, and to get the word out about it. This is something that uh, we are really endeavoring to put out material where other people are kind of steering away from or see it as controversial. We're just diving into all sorts of topics that relate. And so let me just encourage you with this one today. This is one you're going to want to share. And you can go to our website to continue to support and partner with us to keep producing programs like we will be doing today. Before I begin, I just want to say that I'm going to be reading from some notes so that I can make sure to get some information that I wanna make sure that you have accurately to you. This is an episode that I've been wanting to record and share for a long time. I prayed into the timing and the releasing of this episode because it's not just another topic for me. What we are talking about today is something that I have journeyed through personally. At Valley, only those who have had to walk it out themselves will really understand how truly deep and lonely and even dark that it can be. Today, we're gonna be talking about it. Today, I wanna share several things that I hope to help the church understand about divorce. Many years ago, I went through a divorce. For some people, this seems like new development, but it's not. I went through it privately with the love and guidance of dear friends, my pastor, my ministry board, and apostolic oversight, and with the love and support of my children. In this process, I have learned more than I care to, but having made it to the other side of the pain, I'd like to share what I have learned with two groups of people within the body of Christ. It's pretty simple, those who have been divorced and those who have not. I'm hoping to illuminate some of the misconceptions, challenges, and shame those who have experienced the D word have had to navigate within the church. I also want to appeal to those who have not ever had to consider divorce to listen to this episode with care in an attempt to understand how to support those walking through the death of a marriage and why divorced people are not second-class citizens within the body of Christ. First thing that I hope to help the church understand about divorce is that divorce was God's idea. The church has put a lot of emphasis on divorce being evil and bad, But God would not be the originator of something evil or bad. This was punctuated for me when I first filed for divorce when a former assistant who is now a pastor came to visit me and my family. He literally told me that if you divorce, you are in sin regardless of the reasons why. I replied to him, first, you're wrong. Second, that view isn't even biblical. My grounds are biblical grounds. He held his position and still does as far as I know to this day. The truth is, is it was God who instituted divorce in the law of Moses. Why? Well, to talk about that, we first need to talk about what marriage is. Marriage was made for two image bearers of God. And in marriage, we are to bear the image of God to each other. Now, here is where some misunderstanding arises. Many people impose the covenant between God and man, which is a unilateral between a perfect God and imperfect human being as being the same as the covenant of marriage, which is bilateral and existing between two imperfect humans. God's ability and his character allows him to forgive and allow room for reconciliation because he is love and just no matter what. However, in a bilateral relationship, such as marriage, there are conditions. Expectations and boundaries are tied to these conditions. For example, an expectation is that your partner will love and cherish you. A boundary is that your spouse remain emotionally and physically faithful to you. In a marriage, there are vows that are made to the other party that need to be upheld. If they aren't, we are in a practice of exchanging empty and meaningless words. Because of these bilateral requirements in which two people are making not just an agreement to be married, 
but with expectations and boundaries for how that marriage will work. We've stated marriage as being a covenant. I believe it is, but it's also based on a contractual terms that must be upheld in order for it to remain a covenant. Marriage is a gift. It's beautiful. It reflects so much Christ's relationship to us. Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom, and we as the church are his bride. We know that in what becoming such an anti-marriage society, that marriage is to be respected, honored, valued, especially by those who know and love Christ. But what I believe happens is out of the place of high value for marriage, we can make a mistake of holding the institution of marriage above the image bearers. What I'm saying is the church has actually made marriage institution an idol and thus lack care for the individuals that are in it. There is a reality that many believers have to live through marriages that are covenant in name only. What do I mean by that? Possibly by no fault of their own, their partner is adulterous or abusive or has abandoned them or their marriage continually neglects the physical and emotional needs of their spouse or is in the depths of addiction that leads to sin. With true repentance and forgiveness, it's possible to receive healing for these things I just named. These ugly situations can be turned around and magnify God's grace and mercy and goodness in our lives. But not everyone has this experience. Some people have had to make what I call the hard call. Repentance requires change. If there is no repentance present, or if there's just been an overwhelming accumulation of sin within the marriage, the terms of the marriage covenant have become violated and will lead to a complete breakdown. In many ways, divorce takes place with the actions or inactions of the heart before it takes place in a signed document. God knew this. He knew that not everyone would be able to uphold their marriage covenant, where marriage would be the place of safety, love, protection, as God intended. Biblical grounds for divorce in the Old Testament are found in Deuteronomy 24, one through four. I'll read from the NLT. Suppose a man marries a woman, but she does not please him. Having discovered something wrong with her, he writes a document of divorce, hands it to her and sends her away from his house. When she leaves his house, she is free to marry another man. But if the second husband also turns against her, writes a document of divorce and hands it to her and sends her away, or if he dies, the first husband may not marry her again, for she has been defiled. That would be detestable to the Lord. You must not bring guilt upon the land the Lord God is giving you as a special possession. Now, there's a great podcast episode, and I'm including it in the link below for the reference. It's from Proverbs 31 Ministry, and it does a great job of breaking down a particular part of those who want to learn and study more on this. I'll reference some of the information that they provide in this episode, but according to their main theologian, Dr. Joel Mutamale, he explains how rabbis of ancient Israelites in the Old Testament understood and gave grounds for divorce in their historical context. First reason is the most obvious one, which is unfaithfulness. That one is a standard and didn't even need to be spelled out because it was just assumed. But interestingly enough, rabbis would also get involved in cases of material neglect or emotional neglect as well. Material neglect was if the husband was not sufficiently providing for food, clothing, a roof over the head for the wife or the family, just basic needs. In return, the wife was also responsible for care for the husband, cooking, cleaning, care for the family. Emotional neglect refers to the lack of love, emotional care, and sexual connection. Wives were responsible for sexual connection, respect, and support for their husbands. Rabbis would go as far as to impute financial consequences or penalties on the offender of the person that was not fulfilling their marriage covenant in the hopes that the person would correct their behavior. 
In these situations, the immediate certificate wasn't given because there was a process. This process makes me think about how in our modern world, there are states such as South and North Carolina that require separation of periods that least six months and even up to one year and one day in order to begin to heal and to possibly lead to reconciliation before the hard steps towards divorce are taken. This helps with post-divorce regret. Separations as a first step can help each image bearer in the marriage to heal and hopefully reconcile. Now back to the Old Testament. If responsibility was not taken, a certificate of divorce was given to the woman. This certificate would give the woman back their dowry, dignity, and the ability to remarry if she chose. It's interesting because many people will refuse prenuptial agreements before marriage, but one is already instituted in your vows. Basically, you are vowing a contract and stating what you will provide in a marriage and establishing boundaries. The second thing I hope to help the church understand about divorce is not everyone who gets a divorce is for divorce. I remember years ago sitting in my pastor's office after having several meetings to see what could be done to save my then marriage. And my pastor looking at me saying, Robbie, this is done. You have to acknowledge that this is over and it has been over for a while. I replied and said, but Jesus said, God hates divorce. His response really shocked me when he said, I hate getting a cast for a broken limb. I hate getting stitches too. And I'm sure an amputee doesn't want to lose a body part, but sometimes it's just necessary. And don't forget, God instituted divorce for a reason, even though he hates it. He then shared with me in his 25 years of pastoral ministry that he had only recommended divorce to one other person who had been in an extreme abuse situation. I think divorce should be weighed with godly pastoral recommendation and oversight. His recommending divorce to my situation was not him advocating for divorce. And here's my point, God hates divorce. And I can sincerely say, I share this sentiment with God. I hate divorce. Divorce is hard. Let me be brutally honest, divorce sucks. And I'd go as far as to equate it with being like a major death. It's a death of a relationship, a severing of years of history and your family system as you know it. During my walk through divorce, people who were close to me could see the agony on my face. I actually physically looked different for a while. There was a period where things were so difficult, I told my counselor I was thinking of backing off from moving forward with the divorce. At this time, the pain was too much. And honestly, the social pressure was high. I had people who didn't know the details of my situation contacting me, trying to insert their opinion based off of hearsay from others, and it was wearing me out. But my counselor, who was a sweet 78-year-old woman, looked at me and said, Robbie, why would you want to go back to Egypt? Truth is, I didn't want to go back to Egypt. I'm grateful I was able to receive a lot of inner healing and counseling during this period, but I don't know anyone that I've ever met along the way who's been through a divorce who wouldn't agree that it is an agonizing process. There's an unhealthy assumption that going through a divorce almost feels like you're championing it and it's as if it's your cause to champion or that supporting someone who has had to file divorce would suggest that you too are for it. But here's the reality. I had people in my life that saw the marriage I was in, that it was hurting me. It was hurting my family deeply. And though my pastor and counselor are for marriage as a covenant, they did not prioritize the institution of marriage above the health and the dignity of the people involved. And for that, I'm forever grateful. So while there may be some people who get a divorce too casually, and that I'm definitely not for, there are those of us who do so with trepidation and in the fear of the Lord. It seems like in many conversations that we have in the church regarding divorce, forgiveness frequently gets brought up hastily and can even be in an inappropriate context. I have even been questioned about being in a state of unforgiveness for having gone through a divorce. 
That concerns me because the assumption is because I've divorced, there hasn't been forgiveness. Forgiving someone doesn't mean that you stay in a toxic situation, providing them the uh, opportunity to continuously wound and offend. Many people have to be removed from the unhealthy environment to be aware of their abuser's actions and to recognize what has been done to them. When I was a police chaplain in the Aurora Police Department in Illinois, the police department did several trainings with us on Stockholm Syndrome. It was both to deal with the people who were victims of a hostage situation, but my police captain told me, this is going to be more important for you in domestic situations. Even hostage situations, the training emphasized that the abused victims begins to identify with their captor. They begin to see the abuse as a form of connection with the individual. It's not until they are removed from the situation that they realize they were deceived and even brainwashed into believing the abuse was good for them. To move to forgiveness, many people have to step back in order to be aware of the things that need to be forgiven, especially in extreme situations. Now, many will say in their current marriages, there are patterns of sinful behavior or being sinned against and will assume that they need to get out of that in order to move to what I'm talking about. To be honest, I'm not speaking to you. The scripture says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jesus encourages us to forgive 70 times seven. If you are married, you will face difficult seasons. You will sin against the other and you will certainly make mistakes. We all need to operate in our marriages and in our families in a quick to repent and quick to forgive system. What I'm speaking to are both situations that are far deeper and can even be demonic. What can trap people in a place of extreme unhealth? One of my major concerns for those going through a divorce is there is an immediate assumption that they have not thought through the process well enough before taking the steps they've taken. I would encourage everyone to extend grace first. And then if hearing the situation, you're concerned regarding forgiveness, to be very gentle and carefully bring those things up. We as the church, I fear, have more quickly jumped to a negative conclusions rather than assuming the best of the individuals who are going through a process. Even our court system in the West says we are to assume innocence until they are proven guilty. But I fear we as the church have done the other way instead. When I first reached out to a well-known fellow minister about filing for divorce who had been divorced himself, he told me whenever a woman files, everyone suspects the man was either unfaithful or abusing her. And whenever a man files for divorce, the assumption is he committed some form of adultery or has left his wife for another. Either way, the man is at fault. In my particular situation, I neither committed adultery nor left the marriage for someone else. But what was hard about hearing this is I knew he was right about this judgment against men. Which leads to my next point. There is a major double standard concerning men and women regarding divorce. For example, in today's society, if a man were to angrily raise his voice towards his wife and shout out insults at her, he would be viewed as abusive. And rightfully so. But if a woman does the very same thing, you may hear that she was being reactive or she was coming out of trauma or even she was being hormonal. Even in our media, ridicule and disrespect of men is normalized. Making fun or calling husbands names in television is seen as a normal and acceptable behavior. But if we ridicule or dis be disrespectful towards women in that way, it would not be tolerated. Just because men are physically larger and stronger doesn't mean men aren't capable of being mistreated. Men can be physically abused, and many people know some of the worst, most toxic forms of abuse are these types that cannot be seen. Women can mistreat their husbands through fits of rage, anger, outbursts, threatening, and inducing fear, yelling and screaming, name-calling, or use of demeaning language, treating their spouse like a child, public humiliation, and so on. 
because of culture stereotypes that have creeped in their way into the society and even into the church, women are often excused from these behaviors. Another major unchecked abusive behavior women are engaging in that very few people dare to address is withholding of affection and or sex. Jewish tradition in Jesus' time would have definitely made this grounds for divorce. Even in today's time, the Catholic Church views that as a strong grounds for a marriage to be annulled. I have attended many marriage conferences where the subject was so lightly touched on, and yet large segments of the conference were addressing men and addictions to pornography. This was disturbing to me. There are denominations in the Christian world that require a certain amount of sex between the spouses every week in order to stay in their ministry positions of that denomination. Some would view that as extreme, but those particular denominations have proven to have less ministerial people engaged in extramarital affairs. Regular sex in marriage is absolutely crucial to the health of a marriage, both for men and for women. And if any of the partners are withholding of it, biblically, I believe it falls into the category of sin. These abusive behaviors are in direct violation of marriage vows and are absolutely destroying marriages today. Men are actually known for toughing it out and tolerating these behaviors too much. And a lot of them are pressured into staying stuck in these unhealthy cycles for several reasons. They are afraid of being dismissed. They are afraid that they won't be believed since women are typically seen as the weaker of the two. Some don't want to lose access to their children. Abusive spouses can threaten to keep their young children away from them or make false accusations against the husband to the courts to even legally keep them away from their children. This happens all too frequently, and I personally know someone that the courts exonerated from these false accusations after a very long draining investigation. But the trauma of the false accusation is something he's still healing from. Within the church, there is a misapplication of scripture that if a marriage falls apart, it's the man's fault because he is in as the position of being the head of the house. A lot of men feel the only solution is to endure toxic marriage as though it is their cross to bear. And that couldn't be more opposing to God's intention and design for marriage. I can go on and on about this, but research has shown us repeated exposure to these kinds of abuses can be very serious and can have mental and physical effects like depression, changes in weight loss, harmful coping strategies like workaholism or other substance abuses, loss of confidence and self-worth, insomnia, physical injuries, PTSDs, and even suicidal tendencies. Though there are many more points I could make and information that I'd like to share, I'm going to share my final point that I'd like the church to understand about divorce. If you've been divorced after fighting hard for your marriage to prevail, and it hasn't, you are not a second-class citizen in the body of Christ. Many well-known ministers that God has used very powerfully have been divorced and remarried. People such as Randy Clark of Global Awakening, John and Carol Arnott of Catch the Fire, the Toronto Blessing, and others have spoken publicly about their individual stories. Many people take to social media demanding details of those of us in public light as if they have a say in these things. Let me be clear, many times these are very private and personal matters. In my case, I have chosen to be quiet about these details for the sake of my children and grandchildren. The majority of my family know the details but would definitely prefer that they not be made public. I support their wishes and desires. And if you disagree with that, you are free right now to unfollow my ministry and even me personally. But I will not be pressured or manipulated into causing those who are close to me embarrassment, pain, and hardship to satisfy anyone's curiosity. 
One of the things many people state is that if they have been divorced and if it wasn't for infidelity, they cannot remarry. Matthew 19, seven through nine, reading from the New Living Translation says, then why did Moses say in the law that a man could give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away? They asked Jesus and he replied, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts, but it was not what God had originally intended. And I tell you this, whoever divorces his wife and remarries someone else commits adultery unless his wife has been unfaithful. There are two schools of thought that are work here. In this passage, the hardness of heart Jesus is referring to is connected to stubbornness as an unrepented sin. Jesus clearly leaves room for divorce for those individuals that have a hardness of heart or people who have unrepented and possibly persistent sin who are stubborn to admit they are in the wrong about their actions. The second is this. In Jesus' time, if a woman was divorced, she was put out of the home and basically abandoned. That would force many women into becoming mistresses or even prostitutes if their ex-husband didn't follow the directives of the rabbis in providing for them. This is most likely the case with the woman at the well that is mentioned in John 4 and the woman caught in adultery in John 8. This is probably why he is equating women being divorced and remarriage to adultery. Our Western laws today are different and protect the divorced spouse so that abandonment doesn't happen today and it as it did in that time. So whether your marriage has ended because of adultery, addiction, abuse, or abandonment, my message is the same. If you are divorced, you are not a second-class citizen in the body of Christ. You can experience healing and wholeness and even be restored to find love again. There are many of us that are testimonies to that after several years of being alone, last year I had the great joy and privilege of marrying again to my wonderful, beautiful, amazing Arab wife, Tatiana. My boys and I call her Tati. It was such an incredible joy to have my children present to witness and their support for this event and the fulfillment of many prophetic words and dreams and promises from the Lord. There's so much more I have to say to this topic and so much more that I have to share with you, but I think I've given you enough for now. In closing, I would just like to appeal to everybody watching, stay compassionate and caring towards those who are going through a divorce or have been divorced. There are things that people don't need to know. And there are some things that are just inappropriate to pry into. We enjoy keeping even in those who are not in that public ministry details that are private and things about your life that are private. I would just appeal to you, show that same consideration. And we as the church need to stop assuming the very worst of those situations and those circumstances. We wanna to go to the absolute worst conclusions. And in many ways, I think many people have even, as the scripture says, rejoiced in iniquity rather than rejoicing in truth. For those of us that are in the public eye, it's a very hard road to walk. And for our children and our family, it's exposing them to things that they didn't ask for. And many of them don't even want. We have to protect them. We have to guard them. And for their lives, it's not owed. That information and those explanations aren't always owed. Now, there have been some very high-profile ministers that have behaved very badly. I understand. I've worked for some of them. It's been very painful. But that doesn't mean that gives us the right to assume the worst in every situation or in a select few situations. We as the Church of Jesus Christ need to operate from that perspective of clean hands and pure heart. Both those who are going through hard and difficult times or those who are witnessing it. We need to assume the best in each other and we need to pray for them. And if God shows us something, take it to intercession rather than to public formats or communication that's going to embarrass or humiliate somebody or worse, falsely accuse them. 
Remember, that's one of the Ten Commandments. Don't bear false witness. We have to be careful of that. But let me appeal to you. Let's walk out the best. Let's demonstrate Jesus the best by forgiving, by assuming the best, and by being in this place of wholeness that God has called us to. I want to thank you for tuning in to this Radical Radio. It's been one where I've been extremely vulnerable with you. And I appreciate you listening and hearing the entire segment, as I hope you have. And I want to encourage all of you. God has so much great things in store. We may be walking through very dark times in our world right now, but the brilliance of God's light and goodness is there to shine and to break and to shatter the intentions of the enemy for that darkness. So let's operate expecting God's best and seeing his best come through for us. And again, just let me say, if you disagree with my stance on this and the way that I'm approaching it, you can feel free to hit unfollow right now. You can unfollow me and my ministry both if you so choose. I remember John Wimber made a comment one time talking about the church denomination that he led. He said, in other denominations, if people don't like the pastor, the pastor has to leave. But in this one, if they don't like the pastor, the people, they can leave. He said, go ahead, vote with your feet. I would say to you that if you don't like it, feel free to unfollow. It won't be offensive to me at all. I want to thank you for tuning in to Radical Radio and being a part of this. As always, stay radical. This week's podcast is brought to you by Robbie Dawkins Ministries. Do you know someone who would be impacted by today's episode? Share it with them and let us know what they think. Subscribe or follow this podcast so you don't miss our next episode. You can also leave us a review, like, comment, and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Until next time, stay radical.